And welcome back. We are talking with Renee Hanwin today about business resilience and with, uh, sorry, small business and resilience. <laughs> uh, there was something else we were going to talk about, uh, Renee, and that is livelihoods. Yeah, Alex, I think um, one of the things people forget when you, I guess, start talking about businesses and the role of businesses in communities is that, you know, unless you were born into some, you know, fabulous family trust, you likely have to work to bring in money for your livelihood. And your livelihood, I guess, is what pays for your, you know, your mortgage or your rent or your food or the clothes or your schooling or your kids, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what's forgotten often is that when we're supporting people to keep their business in business, that's because we're supporting livelihoods. And if we, if businesses don't stay in business, then obviously that impacts the people they can employ, including the business owner. But that has, I guess, a pyramid effect in the sense that losing businesses loses jobs, puts more on unemployment, um, leads to more homelessness, leads to more domestic violence, leads to more, you know, mental health, major mental health people, um, issues. And particularly in certain regions, and I say, you know, regional regions in particular, leads to suicide. So I think the the reality of keeping small businesses and, and getting them resilient, ready, and, and able to, I guess, face and thrive through every uh, future disruption is because we want society to be, living well and they need livelihoods to do that so I think that's the the livelihoods terminology for me is what's resonating most I think with the governments and you know uh, corporates not to an extent because corporate you know small businesses to corporates are pretty much customers um, or suppliers but certainly from a government conversation I think that livelihood component um, you know is is starting to kind of have a bit of traction and and, and resonate a bit more right and um to take something that you mentioned uh, a step further, if a business does close, then all the other um, dependent businesses are impacted too. It could be a landlord um, uh, who could be, you know, the, the company that comes in and delivers coffee, you know, they've 100%. lost uh, uh, money and a customer now, or the company that comes in and waters the plants. Exactly. You know, now they're impacted. So it, it seems that, you you can have one business go down, but it impacts so many more. Like there there's oh. so many interdependencies. To absolutely, to do, right? yeah, absolutely. And I I mean you know I look at small business and small business communities as ecosystems. So social and um, economic heartbeats of communities, but they are their ecosystems. So you're right. So if a small let's say a you know the postal franchise goes down that, you know, there's no cleaners, there's no, you know, posties, there's like, it, it just has this, I guess, um, ecosystem of impact to suppliers, to jobs. And then also if that business closes down and, you know, there's um, an example of after some bushfires here about uh, 10, 11 years ago, one community lost their hardware shop. So not only, and this is going to sound a might sound a bit silly, but not only did they lose the shop, the jobs, they lost access to being able to buy a mop that didn't come with a 30 minute drive to the next town. And that might seem a bit, you know, oh, well, you know, just order one online or whatever. But, you know, if you need a mop, you need a mop. Do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. and we um, we use the term business. So to me, a business is not just a profit making business. Businesses are also social enterprises like what we are and also not for profits because a not for profit has to operate and be in business to serve those most vulnerable in community. So if you have a small not-for-profit that's not in business or it's struggling or it's put out of business, that in particular, don't worry about the mop. Like that's meaning that, you know, kids are not getting fed and, you know, the elderly are not getting medicated, et cetera. So that has a mm -hmm. major societal um, issue as well. You mentioned using your term, uh, looking at small businesses as an ecosystem. Are they also a uh, identifier for how uh, well a community might be? on a resi resilient scale or, you know, by way of, um, you know, if, if the echo, the small business ecosystem isn't doing well, then the mm -hmm. community at large may not be doing well. Oh, absolutely. And there's so much focus at the moment in many regional communities here from an economic development perspective, because again, a lot of these small, the, these communities in rural areas, and, you know, when I say rural, we're not talking like the outback, like we're talking, you know, just out of metropolitan areas, but the businesses have been so smashed by bushfires, COVID, floods. And when those businesses don't reopen, 
that has a major effect on the well-being of the community. Um, you know, the streetscapes, you walk down the streets mm. uh, like Lismore, which I know we'll talk about, you know, that had the yeah. catastrophic floods. So, you know, nothing's open. There's nothing there. It doesn't bring people in. We had the same thing in the CBD in Melbourne. So we were locked down. No one could go into our major city except for um, emergency services and certain work types. So you lost overnight the cafes, the hairdressers, like they just vanished and not many have come back. But I think when you're talking about businesses in the spate of a disaster, so the emergency services can't come and save everyone and the emergency services are not always in the community when the disaster occurs. So mm -hmm. business leaders are, are untapped assets in those communities because they are on the ground, they're connected to their customers, connected to their employees, they can, you know, share messaging, they can give updates. So absolutely they are so important to not just the response, but to me, the preparedness. And that's the space mm -hmm. that I'm in and really passionate about. And that's where we need to upskill and put some time and some effort and some funding into building resilience and readiness in business people. It's interesting. You said preparedness. And if you do have a weak ecosystem you know, among small businesses, then it's harder to prepare because the focus uh, starts to, you know, I know I would, I'm paying more attention to my business. I'm otherwise I'm going to be one of these businesses that go out. So I yep. I'm not paying attention as much, you know, mm -hmm. outside. I'm trying to focus inside and stay afloat, which lowers oh, which lowers the preparedness for you know the overall community and you know probably my own business. And do you know what, Alex? So that is the absolute mindset that I think we have portrayed and that has become a culture in the small business community. And I guess, you know, what I'm trying to do as part of our Resilient Ready approach is change that culture because you can take one step to get ready for 80% of disasters. So don't think about, you know, is a bushfire going to put me out of business or a power outage or a cyber attack because you can take steps that actually get you ready and in that process of getting ready, you're actually going to do business better in the good times. So mm -hmm. it just means that you can, it means you're not fighting to survive the bad, you're thriving the bad. And a great example is, you know, how many businesses had a remote working approach or when a bushfire happens, there's so many stories of, you know, over here, the cultural or the, the government led approach is, you know, save your house. Yet I hear from, you know, people, it's like my house I can replace. Yes, I would lose the memories and that but my business is my livelihood. I should have saved the machinery. And in Canada, mm. that you, you have that approach, you know, get your business ready and get your business to safely keep operating is just as important as your house. I use that um, in a lot of my talks. Um, but here we don't have that approach and we need to have that approach. And setting businesses up with the mindset and the capabilities to do good business in the good, in the good times that sets you up to thrive in the bad you know, it's it's not that hard. It's just a change in approach. Interesting. I I really liked what you just had to say there. I I, I think a lot of it sometimes is changing the approach. You know, change get get what's out of here, change it, and think differently, and then you can really take steps forward. You yeah, know, that that's where it begins. You know, um, and obviously it's with business some business owners. It's with community leaders. It's with you know politicians at higher levels. They yep. all need to start changing. You know, as you said, the 97, 98%, <laughs> that's a huge chunk here, you know, that you're ignoring. Yep. So you've got to change your mindset. 100%, Alex. And I think to me, it's thinking differently, but I'm going to be honest, there's been decades and decades and white papers and inquiries around yeah. thinking differently. We've got to do differently. And that's what mm. that, that's what I'm focused on. It's like 10% thinking, 90% doing. Let's just do stuff to change cultures, do stuff to change mindsets. And that's why we've got lots of tools and micro learning approaches that we are building and, and co-designing with you know, bushfire impacted communities on Kangaroo Island that got decimated with the, you know, the fires in 2019-20. And they need, they know they need to start thinking differently. So we're working with them to get them, you know, doing things differently so that it's that they're seeing that, you know, can see the results and see the changes. During our break, you had a an interesting uh, example about Kangaroo Island um, uh, regarding a gas station. Yeah, so Kangaroo Island is a little island off South Australia and they got absolutely um, really badly impacted by um, the bushfires. Um, and basically a lot of 
businesses and small businesses in those really impacted areas just never reopened. So a certain western side of the island found themselves that there was no like petrol or gas station anymore. Um, and that's a that's a major problem, not just for the locals that live there, but it's a tourist island. So you can't have tourists coming and then there's no gas or petrol for them to fill up with. So one particular caravan park, this beautiful lady, Fiona, she was like, okay, well, I've never wanted to sell petrol in my life, but you know, I have to. So her business, they decided to rebuild and stay there. And so she took on, I guess, those um, essential services that the community required and set it up in her business as an add-on to her business because well, she felt she had to. And whether or not that will, you know, prove to be a thriving revenue stream, I don't know. That's not the reason why she set it up. She literally set it up because it's a community necessity and as a local small business person and a, and a community person, she felt it was she could do it, so she should do it. And she will be successful, guarantee it, because people will know what she did and would rather support someone who knows uh, how do you how can you say it um, is on their side. Hundred so percent, right? Yep. You came yep. from where we are. You were impacted just like we are, and yet you stepped yep. up to help us. So yep. she will be successful. Kudos to her. Yeah, hundred percent. And she's a really good example. Sorry, Alex, in the sense too of her rebuild, she rebuilt the business side of her caravan park before her house. And again, because she identified that the livelihood was fundamental. If she didn't build it, set it up so she could have a livelihood, then how could she enjoy, you know, the house and and setting up homes? So I think that in itself is an interesting, you know, outcome as well. So let's take uh, a, a, different little uh, look now you had some experiences in Lismore Australia yeah Can you tell so us Liz- about that yeah so Lismore um, in northern New South Wales I'm sure um, many of the people watching um, saw the catastrophic floods um, I can't remember exactly how high but the the flood waters went you know there's a normal sort of fish and chip shop and they have an awning out the front it went past that top of the first part of the Um, first floor and almost up to the um, height of the second floor. So I was up there um, a couple of weeks ago and it was six months after it happened. And, you know, it's just, it's really extraordinary times. And I guess from a business perspective and the small businesses that are still not operating, it's heartbreaking. And talking to some of those business owners that are either never reopening Um, or trying to work out how to reopen and it's just heartbreaking and you can see the community you know the community is doing so well and coming together and really supporting each other but they've got a long journey to go that community has come uh, together before because I know you and I were talking before we even started recording um, and we've already mentioned I have family down there and uh, that live in Lismore and have businesses there and the community does come together because the floods that were what five six years ago five six years ago yep. when uh, um the flood of the century at that time they uh my my cousin james and, and his wife kate um they run north cottage sorry north cottage <laughs> north coast uh yep. wholesaling and they were using their trucks to help other businesses move their equipment and supplies out and putting it up in storage in their warehouse before the floods yep. so that, you know, the impact was minimized and they were doing that for everybody. And it, this flood that just happened six months ago, they couldn't do it because the water was higher than the last time and they were impacted. Um, mm-hmm. uh, sadly, um, I think they're, I, I won't say back to normal because I know the com- the community is still struggling and still rebuilding. So, um, but they at least have their base of operations they can get into now. And I saw the pictures of the, flooded floors things like that there was even a picture uh, and you just explained it uh, quite well the awnings over a a chip shop mm-hmm. and um but there was a picture that i saw up here that was reported that looked down the entire main street mm-hmm. in lismore and all you could see were the tops of the awnings and yep. in some places you couldn't see anything but it was yep. pointed out underneath that water is actually a single story building yeah And when you go back up, I mean, I've been to Lismore many times. It's a really vibrant, you know, um, regional town. And, you know, you stand there and you look at the one from, yeah, five years ago and it's like, oh, that's the biggest one we've had. And then you look at it 
now, the one that happened, you know, six months ago, and it's almost double the height. And you can't even fathom like how, you know, how that occurs. But I have to say, there's been a really um, amazing camaraderie and I guess connection between the business community. There's a fantastic lady up there, Jane Laverty, who has been coordinating um, a lot of support um, for the business community, created, set up a hub for them to come and work in, um, give them lots of, you know, support in terms of how they can try and keep their businesses uh, rolling. And there's a real, I guess, you know, people are ready to set the business up again. So those that aren't quite open yet, they're ready. They're just they're just waiting for the processes of the rebuilds or whatever to happen. But you know, they're re- they're ready to go. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit more? Because that was going to be my next question: is what are some of these businesses doing? right now to uh, get themselves well to be able to open the doors or yeah. if the doors are already open get yep. themselves you know going really going again yeah so i i mean i i observe everything um alex so and from <laughs> that kind of disaster sort of preparedness so i was walking around and looking at you know cafes open and i was like why is that one open but the one down the road's not and then i was looking at how they'd set up you know they've now got painted concrete floors and the you know the the structural setup and that is back to sort of rawness or it's you know there's not the big you know um plasterboards and you know painted yeah. it's back to kind of i guess the the structures of the building and I was talking to them and it was like you know you guys have you know reopened and got yourself sorted and they're like yep we decided we had to for ourselves but also for the community because people need to come together and have a coffee so to me again another great example of you know getting your business back up because it's a service to the community there's another wonderful lady Ellen who's she's head of the business chamber up there and she has this craft kind of stall and she wants to she can't wait to reopen but she's identified that well what I had ready last time didn't work because whilst I'd packaged things up they floated away so I lost everything so she's now identified a structure that she can put in the shop that means she can pack all her items up in floating bags or waterproof bags massive ones and tie them So that means then when the water comes in and then the water goes out and obviously all the windows are smashed and everything, her stuff won't float, well, hopefully shouldn't float down the street. So I guess that kind of mindset that they know that it might happen again, but they don't want to leave. It's their town. It's their home. Um, So they're, you know, thinking differently about what to do to get themselves ready. And she was talking too about um, setting up some storage at her house because she lives on the hill so that if a flood's anticipated, she'll pack up the essential things and take them, you know, with her to this higher um, ground area. So, yeah, it's interesting just the, I think, so many times disasters happen and then you sort of, oh, yes, it won't happen again. So you kind of just go back to normal. Whereas now a lot of the people I'm speaking to are like, you know what, this is the third disaster we've had. I need to be getting, you know, doing things differently and, and getting them a bit more ready. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I think it's uh, part of that too. A lot of, uh, Lismore had a big flood back in, uh, was it 19, you, you told me before we started, 1914? Yeah, 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 around there. Then, yeah. 14. Yep. the next big one was five years ago and yes. then six months ago yep. so uh, for for the one that happened five years ago a lot of the people living there really had no reference you know from 1914 but now right. a lot of these business owners and community leaders and, and just anybody knows we just went through two in the span of five and a half years so yep. yeah, now let's start doing something different because the next one could be three years away. Yeah, yep, you know? absolutely. So it seems they're taking this opportunity now to uh, use lessons learned and really start making change. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, the floods in Lismore, absolutely catastrophic, but also uh, the bushfires that we've had, the COVID lockdowns, as I mentioned. I mean, you know, in Melbourne, there are businesses that, you know, have not recovered from being locked down and, and you know, that's had major kind of impacts as well. But I think the reality is we're in a new era of, you know, compound disasters. Like it's not just, you know, can you survive a bushfire? It's can you survive a bushfire flood of COVID? And there's stories of small businesses. At the same time. <laughs> at the same time, 100%. And who's, who's, whose business continuity plan has that in it? <laughs> um, and I think, um, you know, there's stories of, you know, small businesses that were evacuating the bushfires and she had 127 cyber attacks on her website at the same time. 
So the disruptions are coming, you know, from anywhere and they're, you know, they're part of business as usual, I guess, in, in today's world. So if we don't build that culture and the understanding and make, you know, risk understanding and, you know, we remove, we don't use the jargon words, but use those kind of words to mm-hmm. get people knowing that they've, they've got to think differently and you've got to get, a, you've got to get a bit, a bit better at doing business. So, yeah. because again, so many people fall into small businesses just because of a passion or a skill or a hobby, but really you've got to be, you've got to be good at business because if you're not good at business, then you might not be in business for too long. Right. So we have about uh, three minutes, no, less than two and a half minutes left. Do you have any final thoughts or anything you'd like to convey? No, I just think, you know, if anyone who's listening, who's from any role in anywhere in the world that can really think differently about the small business community, please reach out. Absolutely happy to um, help. But, you know, this is a um, stakeholder group that is really vital to community, social and economic well-being, and they are untapped assets. So I hope that this conversation, and thanks, Alex, for having me, means that we can kind of transition the mindset and approach and, and the again, the funding and the support of building capabilities in this really, really important stakeholder group. We, we still have a minute and a half, so I'm just going to jump oh. in with something you mentioned there. You, uh, you mentioned you know, d- diverse communities with 97, 98% of uh, businesses being small. Can mm-hmm. you imagine the amount of different ideas and thoughts that exist in that pool that is going untapped? Not, oh. just, not just in resilience or business continuity, but yep. in almost anything. That's a huge pool of diverse people to, to Abs- tap into. Absolutely. And also, I mean, the knowledge and the lived experience and also, you know, the business people, particularly in, say, non-English speaking or cold communities, you know, they are local leaders. So why are they not being embraced to, you know, be part of big decision making and, you know, building their skills so they can see it and connect it into their customers, their employees, their suppliers? You know, yeah. it's it's kind of a no brainer. It's almost too simple, but it's not. But it's not. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be the the forgotten or the ignored group, right? Exactly, so, exactly, exactly. Renee, thank you very much for sharing your time and expertise. I really appreciate it today. Alex, thanks so much. It's been so great to chat with you. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And everybody else who's watching and listening, stay prepared, everybody. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.